Okay, um, we, we're going to get started there. Uh, it is fine that, um, uh, sorry, I better speak in here, that, you know, if you, uh, people will be coming in after, from lunch and, and whatever. So we're, we're just going to go through uh, a short, shortish kind of presentation, uh, and then we hope there'll be plenty of times for discussion um, and, and any questions that you might have at the end. My name's Nick Catlin. I work uh, with Decipher. Uh, on a project which is funded by Duchenne UK, uh, Roadmap for Life, and I work with uh, young people, parents, uh, and schools. Uh, a lot of the work I'm doing at the minute is uh, around education, health, and care plans, and so on. Uh, and Janet, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm or sure. <laughs> this, is this, this is Dr. Janet Hoskin from uh, yeah, University of East London. Okay. So the, the plan for the, the session is this. Uh, we're going to talk really uh, basically about three things. One, uh, the hopes, dreams, and aspirations of young people with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. What is SEND, Special Educational Needs and Disability? This is, this is something you'll, uh, you know, that you're going to come across uh, in the education system uh, and at school. We want to explain what we mean by that and what it means for, for Duchenne and what, what solutions to meet those special educational needs and, and in the system it's called SEP or Special Education Provision. In other words, what can we, what can we do in, in school and inside the, the education system to meet the young person's special educational needs? Right, Hope, hopes, dreams, and aspirations. It, it's, I, I mean, I think with uh, our boys with Duchenne, this, this gets missed. And it's so, so, so important um, uh, question uh, to, to start uh, a discussion with your son. Uh, and it might be uh, five years of age, it might be uh, 12 years of age, it might be at 25 years of age, because uh, why does it get missed? I think it quite often gets missed, missed because uh, with, you know, uh, young disabled people in our society, we, we, we tend to kind of shove to one side maybe rather than ignore, you know, the, the, this question of where are you going in life? What is it you want to be when you're grown up? Uh, so uh, it, it's given him the, the opportunity to think about his education. Why are you making me do all this reading, Dad? Well, because when you get older, you're, you're, you're going to need to be able to read to access the internet and do all the things that you want to do for a job or work or, or, or the future. You know, otherwise you're in a long battle of them doing something that maybe they find difficult or don't want to do without any kind of uh, rationale or, or reasoning. So it increases their uh, engagement and motivation. Uh, and it's very important in terms of a, of a reference with your education, health and care plan. In fact, section A of the education, health and care plan, you really, either you or the school SENCO, but particularly you parents, you should have the opportunity for your child's opinions and voice uh, to, to be heard. Um, and also, it's important for uh, teachers, teaching assistants, uh, and, and other professionals to listen to the child and not just make assumptions about who they are or what they want to be. So uh, this is a graphic of, uh, from Preparing for Adulthood. Uh, and these are the, these are, it might surprise you to ask a five-year-old about um, employment, but hello, we do, don't we? If a kid hasn't got Duchenne, how many of you with kids who haven't got Duchenne in the family, you will ask a five-year-old, well, so what is it you want to do when you grow up? Oh, I want to be a fireman, I want to be... It's quite natural. Why don't we do it with the boys with Duchenne? Well, we have to, and, and we must. Independent living, community inclusion, and obviously questions uh, uh, um, about their health. Okay, here's, 
I'm, I'm not going to read them all out, but ha have a read of them while I'm, while I'm, t I'm talking, because these are kind of the responses that you get. And I, uh, th these are just a sample of hundreds of kids that, I've, of, that you know, I've done this with. Um, uh, you know, but um, F, uh, S is actually for Saul, who's my son, but uh, he's 23 now. And this is what, you know, he wants to be a software developer in the games industry. And that, and, uh, you know, he, uh, he had that uh, dream and hope and aspiration, oh, I'd say, you know, way back when he was maybe 9, 10 or 11. He finished up following that route and he got a lot, we gave him a lot of help on the way and exam barriers and all the other sorts of stuff. But he actually went to university and did that. You, I think we've got a slide of him uh, kind, kind of later. Um, when I grow up, I want to be a builder. What, what do you say to that little boy? At, at that point, how old was he? Eight, eight, I think. I want to be a bit, well, you know, well, you know, I don't see you. Are you going to say to him, I don't see you as a builder? I don't see you, you know, putting bricks uh, up on a, a wall or demolishing a house or is that what you're going to say to him? Or are you going to say to him, oh, you want to be a builder? That's fantastic. What does a builder look like? What does a builder do? Well, actually, I think a builder... Uh, designs houses and that's really oh so you want to you you want to draw and design houses? yeah I do because I love I love using Lego and, and that's the sort of building that I want to do okay I won't labor the point but uh, uh, you know that you know the last one is you know I'd like to become a free reader uh, I want to I want to get gold you know I want to be like the other kids so, okay, if that's what you want to be, what have we got to do to help you to catch up with your reading and so on? Right, so this is the law in England. Uh, I've had a couple of conversations uh, with parents from uh, Scotland and, and Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, the, the system that I'm going to describe is, is slightly different, but the, the principles, uh, as I understand them in the other code of practices, are pretty much the same. So, if um, uh, a young person with Duchenne, let's say, has a learning difficulty or disability, uh, if, uh, if they have, and, and that word significantly in the English law is absolutely crucial, has significant or greater uh, difficulty in learning than the majority of others at the same age. Actually, that... That, that, that's a pretty uh, low bar. They're not saying in the in English law that the young person, to have special educational needs and disability, has to be a year behind their peers, five years behind, or whatever. It's, is it significant? And I would, I would go a little bit further, it's not in the legislation, and say well, what we really mean are lagging skills. So a special educational need or disability is do they have, do the boys have lagging skills uh, in comparison uh, to their age equivalent uh, peers? Um, or do they have a disability which prevents or hinders them from making use of facilities, that's in, in the school or elsewhere, that's generally uh, available to others? Okay, so that's the general. Uh, definition of disability. Special educational provision, which I mentioned, we'll, uh, Janet will talk about a, a bit more about in a minute, means educational training that's additional to or different from that generally made for others. So in other words, a reading intervention or an intervention about emotional uh, um, behavioral support or, uh, or even you know, in, in the bottom bit, uh, health care provision or social care provision, physiotherapy can be seen as a special educational need and, and a disability, providing, which it does with our boys, educates or, or trains them. Right, I'm going to hand over to Janet. She's just going to talk about the, the four areas that are in the Code of Practice. Oh. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. Um, so as Nick said then, to have a special educational need, you have to have um, lagging skills in 
um, to show that you've got a learning problem. But actually, learning isn't just about being able to read or do maths. There's four areas of learning that are recognised in the code of practice. Uh, so we've got physical and sensory, and usually that is where a lot of education, health and care plans are met, met well, because, you know, we go to centres of excellence, we see, um, you know, our amazing doctors, physiotherapists, um, and we have a lot of information on that. But the th other three areas, cognition and learning, and I'll talk about this in a minute, communication, interaction, and social, emotional, mental health, are often, can be left out. And so we're really um, trying to address these, these issues. And we've kind of been talking to um, clinicians about maybe giving more information about that as well so that schools are more aware of it. Right, okay, so the first category then. So special education needs category one is physical and sensory, as I said. So we know that they're obviously our kids have got a physical condition and they've got a muscle wasting condition. But there's also other physical and sensory issues that often go unaddressed, such as... Um, sensory being hypersensitive a lot of children you know get over anxious about noise um, feeling labels on their clothes these sorts of things that are to do with having a sensory disorder um, there isn't any I don't think there's any data on this is there but th they mention it in the American Parent Project book and it's something that parents report to us a lot that um, that you know they, they take their kids for lots of hearing tests because they're they're always putting their hands over their ears or a lot of people can't bear putting certain vests on because it really affects their skin and things like that so so there's definitely something going on with with um, sensory processing um, also motor planning so quite often children might have problems with writing or um, organizing their movement which before they you know they haven't got particularly major muscle wasting but there's something going on that's neurological that affects the way that they might um, particularly in things like literacy okay so category two cognition and learning there's a quite a lot of information on this particularly about working memory veronica hinton in the states um, has done a lot of work on this so working memory is you know being able to hold something in your head and do something with it um, and particularly when we're learning to read or we're doing mental arithmetic that's really really important you've got to be able to keep a k and an a in your head and add a t to it to make the words cat so i know that's obvious but these are really 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 crucial skills and there's actually been research done in the general population that the biggest predictor of um, children in primary school is not their iq it's their working memory ability um, because actually if you can't hold things in your head it's really difficult to get on that first step of learning to read and doing maths and doing arithmetic so it's worth thinking about that um yeah okay so the the, the the three Ds, we've got dyslexia, dyscalculia, which is difficulties with maths. Now, sometimes dyscalculia is very specific, and it's about not understanding the value. Often, the boys with Duchenne might not have that. They might just really struggle with a working memory el element of arithmetic. But um, again, some, some children do report having dyscalculia. And underlying cognitive ability. So it might be that some of the boys do have global delays. There is a higher risk in Duchenne of that than in other um, than in the rest of the population, but actually you're much more likely not to have a global delay. Your delay, your difficulties in school as someone with Duchenne are much more likely to be specific. So in particular areas like dyslexia type problems, maybe autistic type problems, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, category three then, um, communication and interaction. Um, so speech and language delay, I uh, think about 60% of children with Duchenne have reported as having um, speech delay, so it's very high, and this can have an impact not only on talking and articulating, but it can also have an impact later on in things like literacy, because it's articulating the sounds, being able to hold them in your head if it takes you longer to articulate, it becomes really difficult to start learning to read, so these all have a, a kind of knock-on effect. Sorry if I'm being really miserable here, but I'm just trying to make everybody aware of the risks and then talk a bit about what we can do about it, but I think what parents have told us is that often these these things aren't being acknowledged in their education health and care plans and if they were then they'd be able to put something in in place so that's kind of why i'm laboring the point a bit um there is a higher risk of autism in in duchenne um but quite often a lot of young people that we come across they might have what we call autistic traits so there might be certain things about their behavior or the way that they interact they might seem particularly anxious. Um, Rory spoke about this yesterday, whether this is anxiety to do with being anxious about the condition or because you have got some kind of autistic behaviour. Um, I don't really know what the answer to that is, but you know it's very prevalent. Um, 
And also, you know, we know that a lot of the young people do can become socially isolated. But, I mean, again, these are things that school can put, put into place and, and make a difference about. Um, so I've just got this thing here. It's called Autism Bingo. I don't know if you can read any of it. Can you? Um, these are the, it's just written by somebody who's autistic, and it just sets out some of the things that, that people have... People who are autistic have, have set out that are real problems for them or things that they, that they like. Um, so they've got things like gets really into music, creative, people look at you funny, <laughs> uh, picky eater, um, has to try really hard to look someone in the eye. So some of these things you might you think, yeah, that really resounds. Other things, maybe it doesn't. And again, I have to say that, you know, we see the children and families who are struggling. There are going to be children who don't have these issues as well. Um, also, there's been quite a lot of research recently by um, autistic researchers. Somebody called Damien Milton, who's at the University of Kent, talks about how people who are autistic are often labelled as having these social communication problems when actually how we communicate with people is very, very important as well. And we have this expectation that they communicate in the same way as maybe non-autistic people do, and it's worth thinking about, you know, how can we, how can we get into their world and find out how they're communicating? Um, because actually his research shows that people who are autistic often communicate better with each other than with people who don't have autism, so it's quite interesting. So offer, also, people who... Or maybe have autism, um, have sometimes things called special interests. And you might find this with your children that they're quite hyper focused on something they're really into. Now, usually in autism, it can be something that's quite um, not age kind of related. So it could be I've got a picture there of a plumbing system, for example. So some people might get really, really excited about how you know plumbing systems work in a building. And so you might take them to Disneyland and it's really fantastic, but really they just want to know how the plumbing works. Or um, you might go, somebody else talks about, you know, being really into, like, the French Revolution. You know, go to Paris, look, it's the Eiffel Tower. We can do that, oh, no, no, you know, I want to know all about the French Revolution. I mean, that's not bad at all, but it's just that there might be specific interests. Or there might not be. I've put other things up there that are very age-related, and not a, lot, a lot of our boys are really into gaming and those sorts of things, and you can understand that, actually, that's... Often, if you're going to be in a wheelchair, then it's about finding things that you can do. So, of course, that makes sense as well. So I'm not saying it's necessarily something to do with a, you know, a predisposition in the brain. Oh, this is just us. This is Saul was 21, our son Saul, in lockdown. And he's always been his special interest, if you like. I mean, he took ages to learn to speak. And eventually, when he did speak, I used to have to sit and listen to about an hour and a half of Star Wars because he was so into Star Wars and, and um, Marvel and DC and all these sorts of things. So when it was his 21st birthday in lockdown, we all just dressed up as Marvel characters. Which, Although, of course, I was like, you know, in, in, in the wrong because I'd gone DC, and apparently that's not right because <laughs> Wonder Woman's DC, but who knew? Anyway. Okay, and the, um, the fourth um, SEN... Um, category is social and emotional. And I know that Rory talked a lot about um, look, talked about anxiety yesterday and, and being anxious about um, being anxious about the condition and how you're feeling and and all these sorts of things, which are really really important. And do look at um, David Schoenfeld's chapter in the book because um, I'll talk about the book later because that's really really helpful as well. And I think Rory's slides will be available, won't they, um, in a couple of weeks. Um, ADHD comes under this category of social, emotional, and mental health, even though it's a specific learning disability, because it's kind of treated through the health service. It, for the code of practice, it comes in this area. And also, children who have ADHD may well benefit from being medicated by things like Ritalin. Um, so again, this is something that needs to be dealt with through the right channels and needs to be assessed by, um, by a, a psychiatrist. Some of these things that... Um, Duchenne. <laughs> Sorry, some of these difficulties that young people with Duchenne suffer from are also, I think, symptoms of the menopause, because I keep forgetting everything I'm saying, so um, I'm very sorry about that. Um, yeah, and also this obsessive behaviour um, seems to be quite prevalent with, with young people, you know, really over-worrying about things or, or stressing out about whether their socks are on at the same, same level. A lot of families have said that to me. Okay, ADHD then, you know, ADHD isn't always really, really someone hyper because actually our boys aren't going to necessarily be running around, the, running around the room, you know, like other kids their age. But it might be that they're verbally very, very um, active, very impulsive, not thinking before they, they do anything. Or they might just be staring out the window. They might, you know, just not be focusing. And the flip side of that is they might be over-focusing. 
some people with ADHD are very good at really hyper-focusing. So, um, just to say then, I've just given you a load of deficit, a load of things that you're going to have to think, oh no, she's really depressing, we've already heard all these bad things. But um, actually, there's loads of positives with young people with Duchenne as well. And, you know, let's think about how we can start with the positives. You know, a lot of our young people do have good knowledge. Um, you know, I don't know if you have had to sit through Star Wars or dinosaurs or goodness knows what. Um, I think Emily said that... Um, Eli at one point was really into sort of 1980s football teams or something. You know, and there's all these kind of things that you have to. Yeah, pardon? Roadmaps, Road right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> right, okay. There you go then. So you know, but amazing. And and you could think, well, you know, what? That, that's a, a skill that I don't have. You know, and and I have really bad visual skills, for example. So you know, there's something there that he can be doing that would be interesting. Start with his interests, really. Um, yeah, Veronica Hinton calls um, the boys that she's assessed hundreds of boys with Duchenne and she calls them you know, little professors, a bit like the Asperger's Asperger did because actually they seem to know so much when you, often when you talk to them but when the, you're asking them to read something or write something it becomes another issue so you know loads and loads of information but you wouldn't know it so how can we get around that at school, how can we make sure that there's somebody there who might be writing down their ideas or you know recording their ideas or maybe they're the person working a group who's, who's got the, who's the ideas person and somebody else is the scribe so there's lots of things to think about um, yeah, you know, another positive is that they can say it how, it how it is, telling your TA that she's put on a bit of weight or something. You know, it's very honest, but isn't necessarily the best thing to do um, to, to get you kind of well liked at school. But, you know, these are the sorts of things that we, we do come across. Good at hyper focus, I've said that. Um, won't give up once you've decided to do something. I think quite often a lot of the boys do seem to be very sort of, you know, um, determined to carry on with what, what they like doing. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes you have to tear them away from it to go and clean their teeth or something. Um, okay, so special education provision, I'll be really quick here, sorry. Um, so building new skills, what's really, really important is that we do it in collaboration with the young person. So like Nick said earlier, we sit and we talk to them about what it is they want to do. You know, how, where do they see life in five years? Where do they want to be? And then we work backwards. So, you know, I want to be a good reader. Well, what does that look like? A good reader means somebody who can read Harry Potter in five years' time. Okay, so if you want to read Harry Potter in five years' time, what do you need to be doing in three years' time? What do you need to be doing in two years' time? What do you need to be doing now? What can we do? Again, if it's a young person who wants to go to university, and they're 14, it's like, well, how do you get to university? Well, I need to pass GCSEs and A-levels. And, OK, let's go and look at some colleges. Let's go. And so, you know, it's a way you start with a big picture and then you're working backwards because everybody needs a plan in life. And if you've got, a, you know, if you're disabled, you do definitely need a plan because you've got lots of services that are there to benefit you and to help you, but you need to know who, who you need to talk to and who to get the information from. Um, so... I've just got a list here of things. I'm not going to read them off the list, but a lot of the support that, um, a lot of the intervention is from a teaching assistant. Again, that needs to be sorted properly so that the teaching assistant isn't just subcontracted by your son to do the work for him, which can happen, um, and that they're actually, you know, enabling him, talking to him, finding out what it is he wants to do, what he needs to know, um, and setting him targets, yeah? But the more that we can get the young people to help think about where they want to be, you've got their investments, and it's their idea. It's not you just telling them they've got to do this. Um, okay. And there should be a provision map in school. So if you've got your education, health and care plan, there will be a provision map that we're attached to that that will show where your young person is getting the support and what for. You know, the more specific that is, the better. And, and it will tell you, you know, what's happening, who's doing it, when's it going to be reviewed. Oh, okay. And I just put this post, this is Saul, our son Saul, who had a lot of difficulties in, in school. Um, he is borderline autis, autistic, he has got ADHD, um, he really struggled, I'd say, his dyslexia, he probably ticks nearly all the boxes, to be honest. But, you know, he worked really, really hard, you know, he, he did so many past papers for GCSE, and he got his GCSEs, and then he went on to um, do his... He didn't do A-levels because that was a lot of writing that he didn't want to do and a lot of academic stuff. So he went on and did a B-Tech in IT software. And then he went to university at Southbank. So, um, you know, the, 
the um, old polytechnic universities, the widening participation universities, are absolutely fantastic. If your son isn't particularly academic, he went on to do a games design course um, for three years. And, and I wouldn't really have minded if he hadn't passed it, to be honest. It was just the experience of going off, going, living in halls, meeting other people. And when he got there, he said to us, you know, I've, am I talking too much? Okay, yeah. Um, he said, I can't believe it. At university, they just don't care about the chair. You know, for the first time he'd gone in and met people and they weren't making a big... And also in a widening participation university, you quite often have older people there. You know, it isn't just a lot of 18-year-olds who've just left home. So anyway, I would just say to you, consider university. A lot of people say, oh, no, I'm not going to go. He doesn't, he's not academic. He doesn't want to go. But actually, it's an experience. It's, you know, an exciting time. He'll get funded. It's all got a, a accommodation. They actually built a room for him and put a, put a, um, a track, a healing... healing blah, blah, blah. Hoist, that's it. Ceiling hoist, not healing joist. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and a bathroom and all these sorts of things. So, you know, it's really worth thinking about, is what I say. So keep those aspirations high and, um, you know, help your young person to be excited about the future. Don't let, that, don't let Duchenne make the elephant in the room that you don't want to ask him about what it wants to do. And I think that's it now. Oh, we were just going to show you this, but um, I don't know if it's going to work. Oh, it's, it's just a bit of software that he's been making recently. That's Saul's dystopian world that we have to deal with uh, uh, together with Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, my God. Just, just don't go there. Otherwise, you'll be dressing up as an elf. OK. Uh, please, uh, we've got about 10 minutes. So any, any questions or anything? Yep. Uh, anything you want to share with the rest of the families here? Hello. <laughs> um, Joe and I, we're um, advisory school teachers. Um, and one of our aims at the moment is to find role models for all of our children on caseload. Um, we would really like it if perhaps between uh, this weekend, someone can get together and find those role, role models for children with Duchenne and perhaps put them on the do Shen's site, share them out, and if anybody else has got case studies that they'd like to support with that kind of thing for our children who we're desperately trying to create, you know, where they're going, what their future looks like, and give them real, uh, true reality for their aspirations. Yeah, no, that, that's a really great idea. Uh, we, we didn't mention it uh, in the presentation there, but there there's something that we used with Saul called a wiki, and we can talk to you a bit about it afterwards, or, uh, which is like a little website where the young people can put, you know, uh, photos, clips of things they've done. They, they can even, uh, with, with Saul, I don't know, she's probably not here, but I actually put a, a picture of his consultant, Ross Quinn, living up there. Uh, so it all kind of, uh, and she would show this when she went, even went into the muscle clinics, but also at school during reviews. You know, this is who I am. This is my dog, my goldfish. This is my mum. This is my consultant. And, uh, and it, it empowers them to be able to start that that process of, uh, you know, hopes, dreams, and aspirations. So, yeah, the role models uh, are a great idea. Uh, and also, the, there's an organization called DMD Pathfinders. Actually, they're called Pathfinders Neuromuscular Alliance now. I'll give you a leaflet afterwards, but th this is an organization set up originally by men with DMD over the last 10 years, and there's lots of people that they're doing amazing things and, um, you know, doing jobs, having relationships, all sorts of things that we want for our young people. Hands up, the microphone's coming round. Hi, hello. I'm just standing because I'm little, but I'm very loud. Um, I just wanted to say, in terms of, um, you said you want the role models, to also think of the children that have gone to be successful in a different way. So, for example, having gone specifically from mainstream school, or maybe have gone through a special school, 
Would they have to have gone to go to university or college or do something they really enjoy? Um, quick example, my son, he had a fantastic time on mainstream school, really good support, the best LSA he could ever have, lots of friends. Come on secondary school, we thought, okay, secondary, more difficult. Let's get him a place that's adapted, that's gonna support him to go into college. It was a disaster, car crash disaster. He did not cope with special school. So we took him out because his mental health really, really deteriorate. And we thought, right, what well, we find you a good place, we have your home with a tutor, one to one, we get you on the local community or homeschooling. Um, so you don't have nothing in between, you know, what the local authority go through, all the channels and here and there. And then it turned out that I saw a complete change from my son. He has become, um, in about six months that he's been homeschooled, uh, he got more out of it that he go on the specialist school in the three weeks he was in there. He is calm, he's concentrating, he's um, getting ready for his exams. Uh, he has a social side with a lot of children at home school, and he is going to come back to, into education, but there was that gap, and it was filled, and it was what he needed. So what I'm trying to say is that maybe success, um, it looks different for different children. So I appreciate when all the, all the boys come and they show us they've been for university and they get married and having children. But sometimes if you look from now, when your son is little, it looks like a really long time ahead. So there's ways to get there, but on different ways. So all I'm trying to say is when you look at success stories and role models, please also include the children with ASD, ADHD, that are successful in a different way. That's what I'm trying to say. About Sorry, Marianne. I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's really important that we're working with... We're not trying to homogenise and say every child with Duchenne is like this and absolutely, you know, what is it? What's right for your young person? And I think that's why it's so important to, to talk to them and find out what it is that they're really passionate about as well. But yes, I, I totally take your point. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a bit opposed to homeschooling personally. Uh, this, is, this is a difference of opinion maybe, but, but, but I am because, uh, you know, I think our young kids need to be in mainstream education. The, pro the problem is... Uh, that mainstream education uh, sometimes breaks down. Uh, and it's not because that's the wrong idea, but I think in mainstream education is where, you know, you get the, the best teaching. Uh, you know, us parents aren't the best teachers, as you probably found out in COVID. The, you know, the best teachers are people that have spent four years training, and they're in our mainstream schools. The, prob the problem increasingly that I'm experiencing in supporting families is that the some of the, that provision, that support, just isn't there, and so it breaks down. And uh, but that that doesn't mean to say that mainstream education isn't the right place for them. That's yeah, my opinion. Say, I yeah, hang on, let's move on. Sorry, uh, sorry. Hi, um, I'm Marion. I'm a physio. I've been doing this 35 years. I've known thousands of boys on the whole of the spectrum. And it worried me a lot that you had physio in the EHCP and not OT, because the OTs need to be in there. If the boys don't have good seats to sit in, no wonder they can't concentrate. If they're falling all over the place, they need to be using laptops from young, because if writing's difficult, it may be that fatigue's an issue. Well, if you bring in both hands, you reduce the level of fatigue, you sit them straighter. It does seem to be something that should be started earlier. That's one side of it, but OT needs to be in there. Nick mentioned the elephant in the room. Physio is often the elephant in the room and just highlights the fact that the boys have got Duchenne in school. And I think physio in school can actually be a real negative when the boys are singled out for their stretchers or taken out of PE to do their physio. I don't think that's always the right thing to do. I think if you go in a bit early, maybe you have these stretchers before everybody else arrives, that's a positive. But to be taken out of PE or to be taken out of a lesson just highlights the fact that you're different and I think this has to be thought about very, very differently. One of the things that we're very keen on is the boys do not have adapted PE, that PE is adapted for every child because there are ways of doing it. You can do circuits. Cricket was developed for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Is there anything slower or better for Duchenne than cricket? I mean, you know, it had to be developed by somebody with Duchenne. 
but there's lots of things you can do that integrate them, not adapt it. Everybody should be doing the same. Everybody should be given the same opportunity. It's really important to me. The great stuff on the Action Duchenne website, I have to say that because I helped them write it. We do need to update it. The kids shouldn't be left out on fields in, in the middle of winter freezing while the rest of the kids are running around. There's all sorts of things that should be brought together. And the other thing is this label that I hate, and so many doctors use it, of learning difficulties. This child has learning difficulties. No, they have a different way of learning. And so often parents get worried that their kids won't be able to go on to research trials because they won't keep still or they have a learning problem. And what we found in physio is that 90% of the boys can do a full assessment. You just have to work to them not expect them to fit into the assessment. So please don't get worried that your children may not be suitable for trials. The important thing is that we work for them. They don't have to work for us. And we have to make it accessible. Now, there are kids who can't cope with the trial environment. They can't cope with the rigidity of the assessments and the way they have to be done. But a lot of the boys can do a full assessment. So this learning difficulties, learning, you know, problems has to be taken child by child. Don't allow people to label your kids. <laughs> One more. Uh, Marion, you're right about OT. It was, it was an omission. Um, my question is, what, I must have a learning disability because I've been asking for two years for an EHC for my soon-to-be four-year-old. I want him to start school with the right foot. I do not want him to be left behind feeling absolutely shit about himself because he's in a mainstream environment where if the teacher asks a question, he's going to be slow to put his hand up and he's going to be slow to find the word, but he will know it. So I want him to start school with an EHC and yet I've had two years of going, can I have one? We'll do it at my support plan. It's never been submitted. We'll do a my support plan. It's on the wrong paperwork. We'll do a my support plan. Hang on a minute. We can educate the Duchens out of him. All we need is a plan of how to manage him in mainstream. And we are not getting that. Is there any... Am I asking in the wrong way? <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, the earlier we, we go through the process, uh, you know, the, the better. Um, I, I, I can offer, you know... Uh, um, after the meeting, any any parents that that want some support, we through decipher. You know, these are the these are very common issues, unfortunately. Uh, and you know, we we that's why I mentioned send up there to begin with, because we have to collect evidence uh, by law of special educational need and disability. Uh, and uh, it is a, unfortunately the the legal system. Uh, and the code of practice is a deficit model, uh, and, and, that, and that's how it is. So we have to, that's why I defined what special educational needs and disability was, where they're significantly lagging skills compared to their, their peers. We have to collect that evidence and, and advice from various professionals from school um, and, and so on, and we have to put that to the local authority, and then the local authority will make a decision whether... Uh, there's significant evidence that he has that, that, that kind of complexity of need which a vast number of our boys has. If, that, if, if that's the case, then they'll go ahead and fully assess for an education and health and care plan. If they say no, then we can appeal. And we're winning... Is uh, 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 here? I don't know. About nine, Sarika, well, yeah. I wish we had more time because we could tell you. How, how many years was it? We we're over a year uh, with Sarika's uh, local authority, but we won. And, and eventually the, the, the local authority completely caved in and we got the education, health and care plan through. Unfortunately, I have to say, unfortunately, within the system, that's get becoming more common because it's based on the fact that local authorities, and some of you parents need to do something about this politically, because the local authorities have been starved of funding from our current lovely government. 
And because of that, the knock-on effect is that they're trying to make savings. And the areas that they make savings in are special educational needs. You, it's absolutely happening in every borough across the country. Where I live in Waltham Forest, they're making £17 million worth of cuts now, and it's going to affect... So, so, so the, just the last thing is, so the knock-on effect will quite often be, well, we can't really afford to have, for this boy to have a one-to-one -one TA, so we'll employ a barrister and fight the family. Okay. okay, just very quickly then, if you haven't got a copy of the Guide to Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy, you can get a free copy from Duchenne UK, so please do get one of those. Um, I've got two other books up there as well. How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk is brilliant. It really helped me with my teenage daughter <laughs> and my son with Duchenne. So um, I would really recommend that. And Ross Green is somebody that um, James Poiskey talks a lot about from the States, who talks about uh, working collaboratively with children rather than having, you know, big busts up, bust ups, and that's really helpful as well. So I recommend those books. Thanks ever so much for listening and contributing. Yeah, if you want, if you haven't got time to talk to me right now, pick up a card. Hey, we've got business cards. We're really, <laughs> we're really posh now. Uh, but do pick up a card. That's my uh, email address, and my phone number. Just email me. Get in touch and we can start further conversations after delay. Thank you ever so much. Thank you so much.